The story of World War II is not only a tale of great battles. Diplomatic skirmishes were no less dramatic than what took place on the front lines. Soviet forces moved to a complete advance on Warsaw. How and when the idea of a cordon sanitaire was born around Russia? Who actually aided the fascists and pitted Europe against itself? We visited the most famous battlefields in order to explain in detail the liberation of Europe. For the first time, thanks to recently decoded documents, we retrieved dialogues between guards, including secret negotiations in Yalta and Potsdam. The grandsons of Stalin, Roosevelt, Churchill, Hess, and the son of Ribbentrop. My name is Rudolf van Ribbentrop. Voices silence since then will bring life back to the era, explaining how the lingering shadows of World War II dictate world politics even today. Our film is about the undisclosed pages of the fiercest struggle in history. May 10, 1941, at 10.15 p.m., a British farmer named McLean hears the roar of motors above his home. He rushes outside at the same moment as a parachute lands in his yard. The stranger strikes up a conversation in English, although with a German accent, with the confused farmer. I am Captain Alfred Horn. I have a very important message for the Duke of Hamilton. The one who introduced himself as Captain Horn, in fact, is the second in command of the Third Reich and the closest ally of Adolf Hitler, Hermann Hess. Hess sends a written message to Hamilton, which causes Hamilton to call Churchill in the middle of the night. Mr. Prime Minister, the Duke of Hamilton is asking for you on the phone. At this hour, what happened, William? Why are you so pale? It's urgent, Mr. Prime Minister. Hitler offers peace and a joint attack on Stalin. This is the most sensational occurrence for many centuries. What Hess offered Churchill in particular, we still do not know. Documents that reveal the truth about that visit were classified as secret by the British intelligence service in 2002. Hitler kept returning to the question that the British and German nations are countries very close in spirit and blood. These nations that should not fight because if they fight each other, it's a crime against blood. It is a loss for both sides. Hess will remain a prisoner of Britain until Nuremberg. In the trial, the prisoner number seven will behave strangely, give incoherent affidavits, simulate memory loss. In prison, referring to the strict rules, he spent decades not willing to talk with other prisoners. On August 17, 1987, 93 years old Hess was found in prison with an electric wire around his neck. The official version became suicide. But Hess's son, Wolf Rudiger Hess, said bluntly, it was premeditated murder. I don't have any doubt. It was the year when my father would have been pardoned and released to freedom. In early spring of 87, father himself told me, the Soviets agreed to release me, and so the British will kill me. The widow of Hesse's son still adheres to this version. 
As for suicide, he was already an old man, and he could not commit suicide himself. However, the report of the prison management stated that he strangled himself, lifting himself up on the wire wrapped around his neck. Who would benefit from the death of the last inmate of Spandau prison? And what kind of opposition to the Soviets and Britain could Hess tell after being liberated? Documents revealing the details of Hess's death will be declassified only in 2032. And Britain always pushes back that date. In the railway car of Marshal Falk, the French commander of the troops of the Entente, the supreme allied commander, the representatives of Britain, France and the delegation of the Kaiser's Germany gathered. The humiliating scene of the signing of the German surrender is appointed as a good theatrical performance. In addition to the ceasefire, Germany has to agree on the division of the state, a ban on manufacturing, even the performance of works of German composers is regulated, but more importantly, Germany, ravaged in the war, is charged with astronomical repairs, nearly 100,000 tons of gold. A country could not pay off that amount if it had centuries. Here and here. Realizing the absurdity of the situation, one of the French servicemen read the contract and said disappointedly, this is not peace, it is a truce for 20 years. Well, that's all, gentlemen. Germany that unleashed the First World War had to admit defeat. The only country that does not participate in dividing the big German cake is Soviet Russia. The Germans were humiliated by the reduction of their territory to the enormous reparations which were imposed, a humiliating occupation regime from Britain and France. This is a people who, rightfully, considered themselves great. This old man, who hardly moves in his own manner near Bonn, he is already 94, and he is at that age when to hide the past is useless, though his past is really priceless. An officer of the Wehrmacht, one who went through the war from Poland in 1939 to Berlin in 1945, but most importantly, he is the son of Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister. This is the first interview that I have given on Russian television. He is the personification of German history since the beginning of the last century. During the period of the monstrous German crisis, he was a child at the time of the creation of the NSDAP. As a teenager, he fought in World War II. He repented for his father after the Nuremberg and aging quietly in the country, the locomotive of the European Union. My name is Rudolf von Ribbentrop. My father was a foreign minister in Hitler's government, and I I used the opportunity to tell some things about myself, which I then wrote, and which may have a certain historical interest. 
He never talked to Russian journalists. Rudolf von Ribbentrop is now ready to open the veil of secrecy about the leaders' negotiations of Nazi Germany and the world and tell us about his family history and who helped to establish German Nazism. Actually, I always had close contact with my mother. My mother was entirely devoted to political affairs, and she told me everything. My father was very busy. Of course I saw him and spoke to him too. But the real information we all received from mother. Very detailed, very detailed. Then, after the Treaty of Versailles, all German colonies and almost 14% of the territories of Germany itself were divided between Allied nations. Alsace-Lorraine was returned to France. Belgium received the Eupen Malmendy district and part of Morena. Poland received Posen, currently known as Poznan, some regions of Pomerania and other areas of West Prussia. Gdansk was declared a free city. The Klaipeda region was transferred under the control of the victorious powers and later it will be attached to Lithuania. In 1919 the Germans heard the word hyperinflation for the first time in a country whose chancellor had fled and on the ruins of the state formed a shaky republic with a growing influence of ultra-rights. The price tags in stores changed every day. At first they increased by 15 times, then by 40, and then the exchange rate is 150 million marks per dollar. Here are some 20 million mark bills that were printed in haste. Germany had a lot, a lot of debt, similar to some European countries now. Then, at one point, comes the introduction of divisional economy. Private funds could not be exported abroad. Very strict divisional economy. Due to this, the opportunity to print money in the country appeared, which is very dangerous. Alternatively, there is too much of it, or inflation. However, this was done, borders closed, printing money began, and then it began to fund highways and so on and so forth, by means of very bad bill operations. The country attracts groups of tourists from Britain and France. They take the best rooms in hotels, dine in expensive restaurants, and allow themselves luxury shopping. They do everything that they could not afford before. The Germans remember the late teens and early twenties very well. Poverty and humiliation become constant companions of yesterday's burgers. In Berlin pubs they were used to filling beer mugs to the brim. But there, in the twenties, they hold back the beer. Every mug is marked, leftover beer pays the reparations. Ultra-right-wing officers and communists returned from the front line gather in numerous pubs. On November 20, 1922, a nondescript American named Smith appears in Munich. He is looking for House 42 on Jorgenstrasse. He has an appointment there with a local politician, Adolf Hitler, who is becoming more and more popular. Truman Smith represents American business circles. He has come to decide whether it is a good idea for America to invest in a man professing some very strange ideas. You are going to find my thoughts extremely interesting. Come! The expressed ideas are plainly anti-Semitic, but the man fervently promises to deal with the Red Plague, to restore Germany's former imperial greatness and to conquer fertile lands in the East, in Russia. The Workers' Party becomes radical and even changes its name. Now it is called the National Socialist Party. More and more people tired of inflation and reparations find it appealing. Among them, former military men are especially numerous.
Hitler already received the Iron Cross first class in 1917. That meant a lot. It was not common for a simple soldier to receive awards of that kind. It shows that he was a brave soldier, but he remained a corporal until the end of the war. He certainly had the gift of persuasion, and it was noticed, and he obtained influence after he organized a push in Munich, together with one of the most famous people in Germany. He held General Ludendorff's hand, so to speak. How did he get the trust of such a high-ranking official? There is something mysterious in this. From Captain Smith's report. The parliament and the parliamentary system should be eliminated. It cannot control Germany. Only a dictatorship can put Germany on its feet. It would be better for America and England if a decisive struggle between our civilization and Marxism took place on German soil rather than American or English. Smith's report clearly hits the right spot. Another figure suddenly appears in Hitler's environment, a man named Hanf Steingl, an American of German descent. Hanf Steingl composes music for SS marches, introduces Hitler to the inhabitants of respectable Munich salons, but most importantly, he pays the party expenses, and even for Hitler's oratory skills training. Hanf Steingl, an American of German descent, allegedly a screenwriter and writer, suddenly arrived in post-war Germany and started helping Hitler tremendously. It was he who sponsored the purchase of a printing house to print a German newspaper, Hitler's newspaper, Völkische Beobachter. It was he who wrote the first assault marches similar to the U.S. student team's marches. Soon, 5,000 NSDAP stormtroopers were marching through Munich. Later, this mysterious character named Hans Stengel will become a press secretary of the Nazi party, and in 1937, just two years before the Second World War, he will suddenly disappear from Germany. He will appear in the U.S., where he will be Roosevelt's consultor on Germany until the end of the war, and then die quietly in his bed. Of course, Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister since 1937, or Lord Simon, or Halifax, the foreign ministers, everyone in these circles assumed that Hitler would indeed be their watchdog, that they would direct him and that they would be able to manage him. A formerly small NSDAP party grows stronger. Tens of thousands of people enlist within one year. The country is divided. Berlin leaning towards communists and the ultra-right-wing Munich. Both, however, whisper about a change of the government. In 1923, Berlin comes into an open confrontation with the Nazi Bavaria, but the resistance becomes increasingly difficult. By autumn of 1923, there are 50,000 people in the NSDAP, including paramilitary fighters. Hitler, however, is not satisfied. At the same time, the famous Dawes Plan comes into action. According to the plan, the USA provides a loan to the Germans and the Italians. The West destroyed and humiliated Germany. A new round of global confrontation now took place on ideological grounds. Previously, there were no ideological contradictions between Germany and Russia. It was complicated to start a war. Now such a cause appeared. The communists were in power in Russia, so it was necessary to bring to power in Germany the most ardent anti-communists. The Golden Thirties set in Germany. The economy is emerging from the crisis. The fact that other countries supported Germany cannot be denied. Americans mainly maintained the political stability in Germany. Most were afraid of the communists, which there were quite many in the Bundestag, and they were hoping that Hitler would not allow them to power, and he himself could be controlled. Soon the Nazi pariah will receive a substantial investment. 
The list of those who helped the Nazis is prolonged by the names of the oil tycoon Dietering, the English newspaper king Lord Rothmere, Austrian Rothschilds, and the American car magnate Henry Ford. You know, it was a very complex system, because prior to that, a report was made by the U.S. Senate Committee about the American monopolies operations in Germany. The fact is that the United States, after World War I, infiltrated the German economy greatly. But they penetrated there through the creation of their daughter companies there. And these daughter companies, in most cases, that is, not in most, but practically always, were managed by the Germans. In 1928, the world makes the first attempt to stop the impending war. The leaders of Britain, Germany, France, the United States, and most European countries, with great fanfare, signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact, a treaty renouncing war as an instrument of national policy. The Soviet Union is not allowed to develop the document. Newspapers write, the pact will be invalid without the USSR's signature. The exclusion of the Soviet government from the talks on the pact suggests that the real purpose of the initiators of the pact is to make it an instrument of isolation and fight against the Soviet Union. Their further behavior will show what their actual purpose is, peace or preparation of war. In 1930's elections, Hitler's party, unknown only a few years ago, wins a majority in the Bundestag. The success of the elections is celebrated not only in Hitler's headquarters. There is no doubt that Hitler received significant financial support from major manufacturers. Powerful financial circles pressured the Chancellor to allow the Nazis to come to power. Just today, the information was received from well-informed sources that U.S. financial circles represented in Berlin exhibit great activity in this direction. Third-party investments to the German Fascist Party are supervised by Rudolf Hess, the second important man in the Nazi Party, co-author of Hitler's Mein Kampf, an ardent anti-Semite. The same man who will land in the yard of the British farmer under an assumed name in May 1941. And the same Hess who will die at an advanced age in the Spandau prison under very strange circumstances. In 1932, in the Reichspräsident elections, Hitler put forward his candidacy for a second person in the state. The Nazis' election campaign impresses with its vast expenditure. Hitler becomes the first politician who arrives to a meeting with voters on a plane. Hitler takes a confident second place, almost three times ahead of the communist Thalmann. It was not yet clear then who would win the elections, the communists or national socialists. The communists could win, but everything went with a very small advantage. The communists could no longer be in power. It brought the influx of the vote to Hitler. He would never have got, and he never did get, an absolute majority in an open election. Well, only after 1933. They joked in Berlin then. The victory in the election was stolen. Hitler is meeting Baron Kurt Schroeder, an influential German banker, at his villa late at night. The former Reichschancellor, von Papen, is already waiting for him. Please, Reichschancellor, you are reading my thoughts, Herr Papin. The transfer of power took place over a glass of schnapps. Van Papen laid down his powers. Schroeder agreed to oversee the financial issues in exchange for the guarantees of his security, personal and financial. Hitler was to receive the office of the Reichschancellor. However, all the decisions in the country are still made by the Reichstag, which got in Hitler's way. The future Führer wants more power, and the parliament, which he does not yet fully control, becomes a major hindrance. Just a month after his appointment, the Reichstag is set on fire. Communists are officially indicated on charges of arson.
Hitler uses the news about the fire in Parliament for his own benefit. Left-wing parties are banned, their leaders arrested. This is how Hitler got rid of those who were a threat to him or to his supporters. Now the Nazis' implication in the fire has been officially proven. The Soviet Union is the only country in the world to notice this at the highest level. In June 1933, the USSR ceases its military cooperation with Germany. There are talks about an imminent war. It starts in 1936 in faraway Spain and lasts for almost three years. Here in the Soviet Union, the motherland of the oppressed from all over the world, we welcomed the Spanish children that had fled from the blood-covered masters Mussolini and Hitler, away from Nazis' bombs. The parents of these children will avenge for the shedding of the blood of the Spanish people. At the same time, Spain experienced something that now would be called a hybrid war. Soviet military officer personnel are fighting there disguised as Spanish rebels. Fascist Germany and Italy officially supported General Franco's nationalist battalions with weapons and soldiers. The world, though sympathetic to the Spanish left parties, does not provide any military assistance. Meanwhile, Arthur Neville Chamberlain becomes the Prime Minister of Britain the person who will support the aggressor appeasement policy in relation to growing Nazi Germany until the last moment. It was he who in just a few months will be crucial in a rapidly commencing redivision of Europe. In November 1937, the English minister Halifax effectively gives Hitler the green light for the Anschluss of Austria. In the diplomatic language of that time, it was formulated as the acquisition. An extract from the British Prime Minister Chamberlain's speech in the Parliament. We must not deceive, and more so, we should not give false hope to any smaller and weaker states, promising them protection by the League of Nations and corresponding steps on our part, because we know that nothing of the kind will be possible to undertake. At the time I was in Dresden, enlisted in the Sapper Battalion of the SS Reserve Division. In March 1938, our battalion was brought to combat readiness in a single day, and on March 12, 1938, we crossed the border into Austria. At night, it was late at night, we went up the mountain by truck in Upper Austria. It was very cold. The so-called Sudeten Germans in the areas of Czechoslovakia, annexed by the Treaty of Versailles, are also waiting for the return to the Third Reich. At that time, Czechoslovakia had one of the largest armies in Europe. It is armed by numerous military plants. There is so much weaponry in the country that the Wehrmacht will use it until the end of the war. Hitler does not fight in the battlefield, but during negotiations in the offices. Adolf Hitler wanted to clarify the question with Poland completely and commissioned my father to hold talks with the Polish ambassador. I then asked the Polish ambassador to come to Berchtesgaden, where we discussed Gdansk and the Polish corridor for the first time on October 24, 1938. I explained to the Polish ambassador that it was time to clarify all existing friction points in order to finish the process of normalizing relations started by Marshal Pilsudski and the Fuhrer. The document in question is a Pilsudski Hitler Pact. Poland was the first European country to sign a non-aggression treaty with Nazi Germany. Until that moment, Warsaw has consistently blocked any attempts to create a Soviet-Polish-Czechoslovak anti-German bloc. Poles also claimed the Czech Czesin region, and the deal with Hitler appeared to them to be very profitable. In August 1938, Stalin invited the Czechoslovak Air Force commander, General Pfeiffer, to Moscow. Have a seat, Comrade Pfeiffer. Comrade Pfeiffer, I promise you 700 fighters, so that you can prevent a German attack. What do you say to that, Comrade Pfeiffer? 
The general left Moscow with an important report, but no reaction on the part of Czechoslovakia followed. Prague was suppressed by the betrayal of London and Paris. As it turns out very soon, it was a fateful decision. Hitler insists on meeting with the heads of the governments of Britain, France and Italy. The Czechoslovak delegation, contrary to the promise, is not allowed to the meeting. The Soviet Union also gets a refusal. In less than a day, the famous Munich Agreement will take place. It will be one of the most shameful chapters in history, the peak of the disastrous policy of the aggressor appeasement and will trigger World War II. The day before that, Hitler actually put an ultimatum. His position on the Sudeten region is firm, and the German action begins tomorrow. Chamberlain replied to that bluntly, you can get everything without a war or delay. The next day, on September 30, 1938, Chamberlain, Daladier, Mussolini and Hitler sign an agreement that will go down in history as the Munich Agreement and make the beginning of the Second World War inevitable. Well, Herr Hitler, I believe we have come to an understanding. Certainly. After that, the Czechoslovak delegation was finally admitted to the hall where the agreement of the annexation was signed. The basic points of agreement shocked the Czechs. That's impossible. We protest. If we sign this, Czechoslovakia will become nothing but a memory. Sign it, gentlemen. Everything has already been decided. The consequences can be very unpredictable. The next morning, President Benz of Czechoslovakia adopts the agreement for the execution without the consent of the National Assembly. Britain is still guided by the slogan of the Conservatives, Bolshevism must die so that Britain may live. Of course, Hitler was not going to keep the promises which he made to the British, but he fulfilled his task because both inside the British establishment and to a lesser extent within the elites of other European countries, there was not only open Russophobia, but there were also plans, calculations according to which the mutual weakening of the two continental powers would contribute to further strengthening and extension of the rule of the Anglo-Saxon world. When the British delegation returns to London, the British hear from the diplomats a historic phrase. Look, I brought you peace from Munich. Chamberlain delighted Londoners. The next morning, after the signing of the Munich Agreement, foreign tanks break through the Czechoslovak border. Those are the Polish Army armored vehicles entering the Czech Czesin region. The newspaper Polska is going to write, the open road in front of us to the sovereign, leading role in our part of Europe requires great effort and resolving incredibly difficult tasks in the near future. The Czechs retreated. Hitler also conquered Bohemia and Moravia at that time. Czechoslovakia was also called Bohemia and Moravia in German. We did not know that, but he did not want for any area in the south to be unprotected in case of war. I also took part there, and our division went as far as Prague and slept in the central city hall on thick carpets. The Czechs feel betrayed and attempt no resistance where Max soldiers call this military action simply a trip. A trip to Prague in March 1939. There was not a single shot, but here, I must tell you, we felt the inner resistance of the Czechs. 
We were not welcomed, for sure. After our triumph in Austria and the Sudetenland, we thought that the general mood was madness. Rudolf's father, the Reich foreign minister, flies to Poland again. Hitler demands the immediate signing of the treaty with the Poles on the special status of the former German region of Gdansk. In fact, this is an ultimatum to Poland itself. My father mentioned our relations with Italy as an example. In that case, the Fuhrer, out of the awareness of the need, renounced the full accession of the South Tyrol. A similar transfer of rights was to take place with Poland and for the benefit of Poland. The free city of Gdansk goes back to the German Empire. They offered to build a highway and a railway along the Polish corridor. Poland will receive a sales guarantee on its products in the Gdansk region. Both nations recognize their common borders. It is even possible for them to come to the guarantee of the territories. It is very remarkable. The German-Polish agreement is extended for 25 years. The two countries conclude a consular agreement. In Europe and overseas, there is still an illusion that Hitler can be controlled. He can and should be reasoned with, but Stalin has sounded an alarm. The Soviet Union will be isolated during the post-Munich period. At the AUCPB, All Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks Congress on March 10, 1939, Stalin is going to state bluntly that a new imperialist war became a fact. A few months remain before active combat near the Soviet border. And less than two years before the war is in the territory of the Soviet Union. In the spring of 1939, the Soviet Union actively attempts to negotiate with Britain and France on the Triple Defensive Alliance. But Hitler's European neighbors are reluctant to get involved in the impending war and do not want to have a Bolshevik Moscow as an equal partner. The Soviet armed forces will not be able to take part in any military cooperation with the armed forces of France and England if they are not allowed in the territory of Poland. The French and British military mission did not agree with this position of the Soviet mission and the Polish government openly stated that it does not need and will not accept any military assistance from the USSR. The Poles are ready to agree to the conditions of Germany. However, negotiations are interrupted by the Americans. In January 1939, my father was in Warsaw and was about to make a pact with Poland. Before signing the pact, the Polish foreign minister, instead of a welcoming speech, suddenly said, I am hoarse, I have a cold and cannot hold talks. Of course, it was the intervention of the Americans. They said if such a contract will be concluded with Poland, they will lose interest in Europe and will not help and so on. And in response, the Poles joined the English camp, the Allies camp. After this visit, it was the first time that my father said to his two colleagues, we must ally with the Russians. Otherwise, we will fight on two fronts as we did in the First World War. Moscow continues to insist on the creation of the anti-Hitler coalition. On August 11, 1939, the delegations of France and Britain finally arrive in the USSR but they are headed by people unauthorized to sign any important documents. The former British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, will call it an intolerable insult to the Soviet government. Stalin is insulted indeed. He agrees to negotiate with Germany. Then there was Stalin's speech, in which he said it is called the chestnut speech. Certain countries should not think that Russia will get chestnuts out of the fire for them. And so he said, it was so unambiguous a signal that we need, in any case, to try to talk with the Russians. Sharp at noon on August 23, a plane with Ribbentrop on board landed in Moscow. I should add here, of course, for myself, that the whole family in general has always been pro-Russian, because our grandfather, Grandfather Ribbentrop, always said that the biggest mistake of the Kaiser's empire was that it had not allied with Russia. The speed with which Berlin decides on signing a non-aggression pact with Stalin is extraordinary for diplomacy. It only took a few days to make the decision. The French and British delegations at this time were still in Moscow. 
Schulenberg, the ambassador, said on the way to the Kremlin, look, the French are sitting upstairs at the embassy, and they want to create a military alliance. It was a rather delicate situation. That is, the delegations of France and Britain were in Moscow at that time? Yes. And the same day, I think they also looked out the window. Stalin made a strong impression on my father, as he writes at the first meeting. He was a very unusual man, his sober, almost dry, but so apt manner of expression, as well as a tough but generous demeanor, indicated that his character matched his name. The conversation with Stalin gave me a clear understanding of the strength and power of this man, who held under control the territory of the incredibly huge Russia up to the most remote villages, and who succeeded better than all the kings before him to rally together 200 million people of his empire. Stalin signs a pact and demands a secret protocol in addition to it. By that protocol, the Soviet Union receives not only eastern Poland, but also the territory of pre-revolutionary Russia, as well as the Baltic ports. That day, Ribbentrop leaves quite soothed. The Soviets, as the strongest opponent, are neutralized. Stalin, too, is satisfied. Stalin's great-grandson, Jacob Jugashvili, now lives in Tbilisi. The Jugashvili family voices the position of the people's father in the signing of the pact with Germany. Disputes about the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact today, they are misleading the majority of the population, the majority of the world. The fact that the disputes, that is, parties of the dispute are, on the one hand, the group that claims that Stalin and Hitler were villains and they had agreed to alter the Eastern European borders, and the other group which say that no, Stalin was not a villain, but they still believe that there was a conspiracy to alter the Eastern borders, but Stalin was forced to do it. The agreement with Germany of August 39th, some imagine to be like a forced move of Stalin, or of the Soviet Union, and so on. Firstly, it must be remembered that Germany was the initiator of this contract, and the Soviet Union did not agree with the signing of this contract and offered its own terms. According to this agreement, the Soviet Union received from Germany necessary equipment that the USSR, unfortunately, did not have at that time. They were optics, fine mechanics, and so on and so forth. Anyway, in four days, everything will change irrevocably. On September 1, at 4.45, a German training ship arrives in Polish Danzig. They open fire from the ship at the Polish fortifications. Thus begins the most terrible war in human history. Hitler puts on a military uniform this day. During his speech in the Reichstag, he carefully avoided the word war, because England and France gave Poland a guarantee to stand up for it. The Führer calls his actions active defense. The fact that the UK still declared war on Hitler after the 1st of September, when he carried out his attack on Poland, was a very unpleasant surprise for him. And the unpleasant surprise was associated with the understanding of the fact that it would be very difficult or impossible to win the prolonged war, a war of attrition and he could not defeat Britain through a direct military invasion. In the Soviet Union, general conscription is introduced on the same day. The draft age reduced from 21 to 18. The size of the army is increased to 5 million people. Stalin understands the more he wants peace, the more he needs to prepare for war. Hitler will be informed that Britain and France declared war on Germany no sooner than September 3 in the evening. My Führer, it can end up in a world opposition. Calm down. 
If they have declared war on us, it is only in order to save face. And it does not mean that they will fight us. At the time, the French army is the largest in Europe, the third in the world in the number of soldiers, and the fourth in the number of tanks and aircraft. No German panzer division can compete with it. All of them fight in Poland, doomed and abandoned by the Allies. The Franco-British Corps, having a huge advantage in power, pass into Germany just a few kilometers in and stop. They bring playing cards and footballs to the defensive Maginot Line, which was built along the German border. There was not a single shot for a few months. There was a constant front line and no movement on it. Nobody opened fire. We did not attack and the French did not attack us. Instead of bombs, leaflets fly down on Berlin. From the 3rd to the 27th September, there are the so-called truth raids. British Air Force drop 18 million leaflets over Germany. It is almost 39 tons of paper. Winston Churchill later admitted that the British restricted to dropping leaflets appealing to the morality of the Germans. In October, the Polish military attaché reports from France. There is virtually no war in the West. Neither the French nor the Germans fire at each other. There are no air raids. My assessment? The French are waiting for the battle in Poland. French and German soldiers celebrate the Christmas of 1940 together. Nobody seems to want any changes on the Western Front. American journalists call this confrontation a strange war. It is as if Europe makes it clear to Hitler that his major attack must not be in the West, but in the East. The signal is heard in Berlin. In May 1941, in a single plane, Hitler's right arm, Rudolf Hess, flies to England. The trip is held in the strictest confidence. Details are still unknown even to Hess's relations. The visit of one of the top Nazis to the country that had recently declared war on Germany can be regarded as madness. If you do not know that until recently, Hess had been responsible for the most scrupulous questions of the Nazis' contact with Britain and the United States. My mom was also a party activist, but she knew nothing of his plans. He did not even tell her about it on May 10, when in the morning he said goodbye to her forever. He only said that he had to be in a very important meeting that day. But why would a Nazi come from enemy Germany to England? Hitler's deputy party leader, the SS general. Churchill, when asked by Hess for an audience, found this news fantastic. This is the most sensational event in many centuries. Whether the negotiations took place, or more importantly, the nature of their content, remains unknown. Churchill refused to answer any questions about Hess from the deputies in Parliament on 20 May, and then on June 10, 1941. Winston Churchill said, at the moment I cannot tell you about it. If the government deems it necessary to make such a statement, it will do so in the future. It is quite possible that Hess informs the British Prime Minister of the impending attack on the Soviet Union. Directive number 21, known worldwide as Operation Barbosa, has already been developed, and Germany suggests that the UK withdraw from the anti-Hitler coalition. But for the Prime Minister, who has just been appointed, peace with Germany is impossible. That is what his family still claim. People think that Winston Churchill appeared on the steps of Downing Street in 1940 with a cigar in one hand and a sign of victory in the other. They do not know for how many years he went to this. He famously said, it was as if fate has led me, as if my whole life has been a preparation for this hour. After his sudden landing on British ground, Hess was put in an English prison, where he remained until Nuremberg. Having received no reply from London, Hitler turns the strange war into the triumph of the Wehrmacht. Yes, a strange war it was, but then the attacks began, and France was beaten within six weeks. Although I can prove it, at least partially, transport and weapons supplies were not large enough, as they could be.
In the early morning on June 22, 1941, at 4 a.m., the Reich Foreign Minister Ribbentrop will see the Soviet ambassador in Berlin, Dekanazov, for the last time in his life, to present to him a note of the declaration of war. For Stalin and the whole country, the Great Patriotic War begins. The last Spandau prisoner, Rudolf Hess, could have shed light on Britain and America's role in all of this. But on August 17, 1987, a few weeks before his release, he was found dead with an electric wire around his neck. He left a will in a note. They would hand it to his family a month after the death of prisoner number seven. Written a few minutes before my death, I thank all of you, my beloved, for all the precious things that you have done for me, your oldest. Yes, my father-in-law told my husband that if his mission was a success, then the Second World War would have been prevented. He did not want the European conflicts to grow into a world one. This idea moved him when he decided to fly to Britain. Later, his relatives would say that the note had been written many years earlier, when Hess was convinced that he was seriously ill, that the British prison authorities specifically changed the guards and destroyed all the evidence, photographs, things, diaries and notebooks. And the Spandau prison itself would soon be demolished. There is a business center in its place now. The details of Hess's visit to Britain are still classified. In 2002, it was decided to extend the period of secrecy for another 30 years. Perhaps this was done to dispel the ashes of Nazism downwind. Or maybe there were other reasons, less pleasant for the British crown.